Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is intelligence failures. In the baseline model of nuclear negotiations, we assumed that each side had complete information. In other words, both parties knew each other's capabilities and preferences completely. There was no private information that one side had that the other did not. Pertinent for the topic at hand, this meant that the opponent knew the potential proliferator's capacity to build nuclear weapons, as well as their willingness to proliferate. In practice, both of those are tall orders. The purpose of this lecture now is to motivate why an opponent has that sort of uncertainty. In particular, I'm going to focus on U.S. intelligence failures. This is for a few reasons. First, the U.S. cares more about nonproliferation than just about any other country, and so it is in a prime position to investigate these sorts of things. Second, the U.S. intelligence apparatus is huge, so if a country like the United States is unable to learn these sorts of things, it stands to reason that countries without that large of an intelligence apparatus would also struggle. Finally, if we're going to analyze intelligence failures, that means we need to have lots of declassified documents. It turns out that the United States has a ton of these exact documents on nuclear proliferation, so we can perform the analysis that we need to. Our first intelligence failure is the Soviet Union. As I've mentioned before in this course, in 1949, the United States' best guess on when Moscow would acquire a nuclear weapon was 1953. What actually happened, though, is that the Soviet Union would test a bomb later that year. There was a similar problem with China, albeit not as bad. In 1964, the U.S.'s best guess on a Chinese nuclear weapon would be 1965. But once again, the actual date of proliferation occurred in the year of that estimate. A 1960 estimate about a potential Israeli nuclear program indicated that there was no evidence of something going on. Of course, two years earlier, Israel had begun construction of the Dimona nuclear facility. An interesting footnote here is that in that very same year, 1958, a U-2 spy plane took a picture of the Dimona facility. Analysts on the ground, however, did not properly analyze that photo until two years later, causing the intelligence failure in 1960. Moving on, a 1964 report indicated that a Chinese nuclear test would not likely affect Taiwan's proliferation choices. We all know in retrospect that that was wrong. In 1974, U.S. estimates placed less likelihood of an Indian nuclear test in that year as opposed to previous years. Nevertheless, India tested the Smiling Buddha in that year, 1974. Indeed, the failure here was so bad that the United States forced its intelligence agencies to reevaluate nuclear proliferation capacities and willingness around the world. This culminated in a special national intelligence estimate. Lots of countries got a thorough treatment in that report, but South Korea did not. It was pretty much an afterthought. And that's despite the fact that South Korea had already started making progress. Meanwhile, a 1976 report indicated that there was no evidence of bomb development going on in South Africa. Wrong again. The year before, South Africa had begun drilling at a military complex for the purposes of an underground nuclear test. A 1983 report projected that uranium enrichment would come in the mid-1990s. Yet that same year, Argentina surprised the United States by opening a uranium enrichment facility. The projection for Brazil was the same, but it would beat it by a couple of years. Perhaps the hottest of hot takes was in 1992, when the United States suggested that North Korea was only a couple of years away from acquiring nuclear weapons. In fact, it wouldn't be until 2006 when North Korea would attempt to test their first bomb. In 2002, the estimate on Libya was that Gaddafi would have enough fuel for a bomb by 2007. Of course, the Libyan nuclear program never made it that far. 
Gaddafi gave it up in 2003. What became clear as the United States was receiving Libyan nuclear materials is that the country had no idea what it was doing. And the possibility that Libya would have nuclear fuel for a bomb in 2007 was basically nil. In 1995, the United States suggested that Iran had a crash program racing toward a nuclear weapon. It's now 2020, and in the 25 years in between, at no point did Iran conduct such a sprint. Perhaps the most famous intelligence failure was in 2003, when the United States went on an international campaign to convince everyone that Iraq was building nuclear weapons. After the Iraq War, it became clear that that was wrong. Summing up, U.S. intelligence can miss both how much a country wants a nuclear weapon and what that country's ability is to construct them. And those estimates can go either way. Sometimes the United States underestimates a country, and sometimes the United States overestimates a country. The remaining question is how this affects nuclear negotiations. And the answer to that is in the next lecture. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.